Good evening, everyone. Um, just a small uh, <laughs> lack of uh, visual feedback problem, but we're here now. Welcome, wonderful Wednesday, happy recent lunar eclipse, and welcome to Rask Toronto Center. Uh, we are online tonight, as is the usual now, and I am Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of the Rask Toronto Center. This is our May 2022 Speakers Night presentation, and this is one of two types of gatherings that we now have online these days, not at the Ontario Science Center, due to the pandemic. Our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about our various programs later on this evening. But first, per usual, we have a very special event to kick off. For our speakers night tonight, we are absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Lori rosso Nepton, resident astronomer at the CFHT, or the Canada-France-Hawaii Observatory uh, slash telescope. 
<laughs> it's an awesome telescope. We might get to hear a little bit about that. But first, I get to introduce our fantastic speaker. So Dr. Russo Nepton is the first Indigenous woman in Canada to obtain a PhD in astrophysics. She got her degree from the Université Laval, I believe. It's uh, in stellar formation of spiral galaxies. And she's received the Hubbard Reeves Fellowship and the Award for Native Women in Sciences of the Association uh, des Femmes Diplomées de l'Université du Québec. Uh, now at the aforementioned CFHT, she's leading an international project called Signals. Um, well, and it's it's just super exciting, so I'm not going to tell you too much about that. But if you've ever wondered how stars are made or what kind of environments can come into play, well, you and all of us tonight are in luck. Our speaker tonight will tell us a little bit about some of these things, probably via the Signals program, I'm guessing. And uh, I'll just say, if you love stars, galaxies, and their environments, it looks like we're all in for quite a treat. And without any further ado, uh, Lori, please take it and us away. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me in organizing all this. Uh, I'm super happy to be all connected with you guys. and. Uh, um, yeah, so today I prepared a presentation that will introduce a little bit uh, what is my big project signals, uh, but I also wanted to uh, show you the telescope, how I got there, um, what kind of amazing instrument I used to observe the sky, and also what led all of, uh, you know, my uh, curiosity into doing signals. Um, and I hope it will trigger some of your interest and questions by the end. Um, so without waiting any further, um, just a little bit of background. So I'm uh, originally from Quebec. Uh, I'm Inu. Uh, I uh, studied in, uh, at La Laval University. And the first observatory actually I've been in touch with was Momigantic Observatory, very close to the border with the US, uh, very cold in the winter, like most of our country. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a very uh, wonderful place to learn um, to use a telescope. And we had so many different kind of instruments and camera uh, to look at the sky with different properties. So I learned a lot by spending time there. And uh, I was uh, doing my master and my PhD after under the supervision of Carmel Robert. Uh, Professor Robert is uh, specialized in massive stars. Uh, so uh, we, we had in mind a project that we're, uh, we were trying to test a prototype, a new kind of instrument to do the study of uh, galaxies and, and stars. Uh, and this instrument was called Espion. Um, and Espion in French means spy, which is a very good name for something that is going to look into the sky and trying to understand things. <laughs> so uh, Espion was, uh, like I was saying, a prototype. So you had to go inside the dome and kind of bring your tools and adjust things to make sure that um, the instrument was ready to observe. Um, and it was great. Uh, to learn about instrumentation and also uh, start, you know, learning how to do observation and how to analyze the data and and do science. And after spending a lot of time at the observatory, uh, mm. I got uh, into a place where I could train other students. And in this picture, you see me over there with other students uh, that I was training to use the the telescope and the spion, the spy. Um, and uh, it also eventually led me into other projects that were involving instrumentation and astronomy, including the building of CITEL. So CITEL is like the second generation of the, this kind of instrument that I will uh, detail a little bit more later, if I have time. Um, I have a couple of extra slides for you if I have time to just show you how this kind of instrument work. Um, and you see on this picture, the engineer, Julie Manda, one of my good friend, uh, being fine-tuning CITEL before it was ready to be tested at Laval University for, for the final test before shipping. And this instrument, CITEL, uh, was built to go on the CFHT, the Canada-France Hawaii telescope, um, which was exciting, bigger telescope, uh, better instrument, uh, and it, it is built uh, to do spectroscopy. Um, so it's not just a spectrograph. It's an imaging spectrograph, but uh, ultimately it's doing spectroscopy. And so spectroscopy is a technique that, um, you know, th disperses the light into different colors so that you can study in great details what is uh, inside the object, <laughs> what kind of colors are uh, emitted by the object you're looking at. Um, and I like this periodic table because it shows all of the elements of the periodic table and their signature, their light signature, if they are excited by uh, any phenomenon. And so um, by studying the light coming from gas into space, you can recognize those signature and know 
Um, what kind of elements are there? What are there abundances? And what is the chemistry of the universe? Um, so a lot of my research is actually uh, related to that. So keep that in mind. But ultimately, the, 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 the mechanism, <laughs> so depending on what you're observing, if you're looking at a star uh, directly, you can see on the top, you have a telescope, and on the top right, you have this, this beautiful rainbow. We call them a continuum spectrum. Um, so if you do spectroscopy of stars, you'll see those beautiful rainbows. And most stars have an atmosphere or gas on their surface. So you'd actually see uh, some signature that are dark, like what you see on the bottom left, uh, on the bottom right uh, corner of this image. So you see beautiful rainbows with those signature that are dark. And they're coming from the atoms that are in between the star and you. And ultimately, if you look at the bottom there, you also have an emission spectrum on the, the, the left bottom of this image, whereas because you're actually observing hot gas uh, that has different atoms into it, and then what you're observing is those signature directly from the atoms. Uh, so they look like bright lines, bright lasers of different colors. Um, and each star has different characteristics, so they can be recognized by their, their spectra. So spectroscopy is a very uh, important technique in astronomy, and uh, we use it a lot uh, to study the chemical composition of stars and also of gas uh, in space. So Citel is capable of doing that. Um, but to make sure it was uh, in good shape, uh, we had to test it. And we had to test it in very cold condition uh, because uh, in Hawaii, uh, at the observatory, we reach temperature that, even if it's in Hawaii, uh, be like around minus 5 or minus 10 degree at the summit of the mountain. And so uh, we borrowed a gigantic freezer <laughs> from the civil engineer department at Laval University. And we brought the instrument in and we cooled it down to minus 20 degree and check out if, if it was still working properly. We did all sorts of tests and eventually send it to Hawaii um, with our team uh, to do the first light. So the first light of an instrument is basically the first time the instrument is actually looking at light coming from the sky. And we had a full week plan of doing tests with Citel. And uh, you can see me on the right side of the image with my computer. I'm in the middle of that couch. And I'm actually analyzing the first data that are getting in. Very exciting. And um, in the same week, there was an hurricane called Guillermo that was launching towards the islands of Hawaii. And we were just very scared that uh, we would have a complete week of like bad weather. But fortunately for us, at the very last moment, Guillermo decided to go north. And we had seven beautiful night of observation. And one of the first objects that we decided to look at was a planetary nebulae. Uh, I think it's M57. Uh, but I was more intrigued by this small galaxy in the background because I was studying galaxies. And that's actually what I was uh, analyzing in the back over there on, on, on the couch. And this beautiful object, um, I was able to very quickly uh, check out um, the emission line coming from the hot gas. And uh, by studying the different atoms with their signature, uh, we can extract what we call in astronomy metallicity, which is basically how much heavier elements are there uh, and the presence of those heavy elements are really important, and we'll, we're going to see why. But also, you can study velocities. So uh, galaxies are rotating, and uh, because of uh, a very important phenomenon in physics, uh, which we call the Doppler effect, if a gas is warmed up and is emitting a color, a very specific color, but the galaxy is rotating, so part of the galaxy is going toward you, whereas part of the galaxy is going away from you. So it will shift a little bit the color towards the, the blue if it's going toward you or the red if it's going away from you. And you can analyze that and modelize the velocity of the galaxy. And that's what you see on, on the middle um, panel on the right. So that's pretty cool. And everybody was happy. And I got to complete my uh, PhD thesis and, uh, and defend my thesis a couple of months after that. Uh, and this is the team of students with Thermal Rabat. On the day of my graduation, I was very happy. <laughs> uh, and as you can guess, it was accepted. And I was shipped to Hawaii um, uh, since I had applied for a position. Very good timing. The position was open at the, the telescope uh, for uh, being a resident astronomer. And I also had a grant to do a postdoc at the University of Hawaii. So uh, everything for me just uh, was pointed toward going with CITEL and continuing to do science with it. 
So I moved there uh, five years ago. And uh, so the Hawaii islands uh, are numerous, but uh, the telescopes are located on the big island, which is the largest one, or the island of Hawaii. And this is a beautiful image of the island. Um, there are some uh, very tall mountains on, on it, uh, but there, most of them, or all of them, are actually volcanoes, uh, some of which are still active. Um, but fortunately, the one on which the, the CFHT is, it's, it's, it's a quiet volcano. It hasn't been active in more than um, uh, 10,000 years. So um, we do have earthquakes. We do have eruption coming from the south part of the island. So this is just an image of... Uh, uh, the 2018 eruption. Uh, currently, uh, it, it comes and goes, but there was a pretty intense lava lake in one of the crater. Um, you can see this is an image from uh, the end of, the, of September last year. Um, so we have to deal with that, <laughs> but it's far en enough from the telescope that uh, we can live with it. <laughs> um, we got, so, yeah, I, I could like, give, give you some anecdotes about that later. But on this image now we see the Mauna Kea. So the Mauna Kea is the tallest volcano on the Hawaiian Islands. It is also a sacred site for the native Hawaiians and a very important uh, place. Um, you can see on the summit during the winter, it's full of snow. Um, it is more than four kilometer high and it is usually above the inversion layer where the clouds are. <laughs> so most of the time you can go to the summit and it will be, it will be clear above your head even though the rest of the island can be covered with clouds. Um, not always, but most of the time. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to check out a little bit closer. So this is a view of the mountain from the other side, uh, from this, uh, this almost the summit of the Mauna Loa. And then, um, and this is it from a view from, from the, the top. And we're going to zoom into the very top of it where the scientific reserve is located and the telescopes, most of the telescopes. If you get up there, it's a very special place. You can feel it. It looks a little bit like you're on Mars. Um, everything around you is lava rock. And uh, you have numerous telescopes that have different uh, specialties, different kinds of instrument. And they kind of do different, all different science. Um, and the CFHG is the one right in the middle of that image, uh, that beautiful white dome. And um, you can see Gemini on its right and IRTF. And very close to us on the left, it's the Keck, uh, one of the Keck telescope. And so um, here's another picture where we can see the clouds a little bit below the summit, very typical uh, weather up there. But let's focus on the CFHC for a second. So uh, if we get inside, you'd see the telescope. Uh, this is a view from the top. Uh, and this is a view from the side here with one of my colleagues. So you can have a a uh, good uh, uh, feeling about this, the, the size of the whole thing. <laughs> but I have a video that will show you how everything kind of uh, get into action. So uh, let's see this. Um, so at about the times uh, of sunset, uh, or just before sunset, we would open the dome slit. It's about like a minute or two, and it's very noisy. So fortunately for you, I didn't put any sound on that video. <laughs> um, but we do that. And we also have little vents on the side, those little windows uh, that are all over the dome that we can open to let the cold air come in. And um, of course, the telescope can point in all direction. And we're going to see it in a few seconds. I'm going to just move that video slightly faster. So we can see, uh, yes, the dome rotation and eventually the telescope motion. So um, yeah, it's, it's a, a very big dome. <laughs> there is uh, some plan to actually uh, build a new telescope in the same enclosure, uh, which would be a, um, a telescope that would be a, a almost 11 meter uh, size. This mirror that you see right there is about 3.6 meter uh, right here. And uh, every three years, we have to resurface the mirror and clean it and make sure that it reflects the light perfectly. And we're actually going to do it uh, in June. Uh, so next month, uh, there's going to be a big expedition to um, remove the mirror, clean it, uh, remove the aluminum uh, coating on it, and redeposit a new uh, coating on the mirror. So my science. I uh, arrived at CFHC. I followed CITEL there. And the thing that I was doing uh, the best and that I kept doing since uh, my, my graduate study is study star formation. Star formation and galaxies. Um, galaxies that are close to the Milky Way so we can see in great details what's going on. And so all these little red spots that are on that image are star forming regions. And I know that uh, because 
It's the presence of massive stars in star forming regions that heat up the gas around them and create those gigantic bubble of warm gas, which then emit a lot of light uh, with those signature that we saw in the, the spectral uh, periodic table. Um, and I love to show videos. So this is a video from a team in the UK um, that is showing a simulation of how stars are forming in clouds of gas and galaxies. So this is a cloud of gas that is about like 100 light year across. It's a big cloud of gas. And with a little bit of uh, push and perturbation with gravity, particles are, um, uh, you know, uh, being attracted by each other and eventually uh, stellar objects are um, emerging <laughs> from very dense filaments inside those, those clouds. And when they are formed, they are, uh, there can be 10 of them, hundreds, thousands, 10,000 stars within the same mother cloud. And they're like sisters. They are made out of the same gas, the same material. Uh, and that's important. Uh, and we can see that the stars, if we would look in details, they, they look actually, they are different stars. They have different mass, but they have, they are made of the same material. And this is a real image of a cluster of stars coming out of uh, their, their mother uh, cloud or their cocoon. <laughs> and um, uh, depending on where you look at or how you simulate different regions, they might form uh, more massive uh, regions like uh, for, in, for example, a very massive region is like the Tarantula Nebulae that contains some of the most massive stars that we know, and so many stars. So there's a lot of um, diversity in the kind of star forming regions that you see around. Um, and the ones that contain massive stars are containing like those gigantic ball of hot gas that you can see at very large distances in galaxies far away. And those gigantic ball of gas, um, uh, they are created by a phenomenon that we called photoionization. So basically, the photons that are emitted by massive stars are going into the gas and kicking out some electrons. And once they do that, uh, this is when the gas gets its full power of becoming like a laser <laughs> and sending those emission uh, lines or those signature that we can see. And depending on the mass of the star, it creates a small bubble, a bubble or a larger bubble. The, depending on the number of them, too, it can change. And uh, those bubble of hot gas is really what, like I used with Citel, is what I'm looking at. Um, but it's the same gas that was used to form the star. So that's important. And within a cloud, you have all of these different stars, some are like the sun, and a few, only a few of them are very massive, generating those bubbles. Um, so that's important. And those very massive ones, this is another periodic table. I like this one too. It's a different one. Um, the colors of each element here shows when they were produced uh, or what kind of mechanism produced them in the universe. So after the Big Bang, we had a very simple universe with like hydrogen and helium, the, the blue ones on the top of the chart. And then um, you need stars to create all of the other elements that, that we know. And um, just focusing on the massive stars, which are the green ones. So if you look at all of the elements that are produced by massive stars, there's actually a lot of them. And if you uh, are careful, you'll notice that a lot of them are actually very necessary for life and what we have on Earth <laughs> and other things like that. So massive stars are really important for our understanding of the world around us. So to study star forming regions, you need ingredients. You need to know a lot of things about them. So um, there's the, the stars and there's the gas. Um, and to, to fully kind of really model and understand all of this, you cannot separate them. <laughs> they go together. So you have the stars, you have their the, the light that they emit or the ionizing photon spectrum. You have the gas, the gas density, how how much gas there is around them, uh, what kind of elements are in the gas, we call that abundances. And then, like I was saying, the photons are doing that, that, that interaction where they kick out some electrons out of the atoms. And then you have a kind of soup of free electrons that are kind of like going in all direction. Uh, and this is like your power to, to, to generate that light coming from the gas. Um, so that's very important. And these bubbles, they, they get created very quickly. As soon as a, star is, a massive star is light up, 
it takes only a few hundreds of thousands of years to create those gigantic bubble and then they remain there for a couple of millions of years um so that's important and um they remain there for a couple of millions of years in between one to 40 million year you'll have that bubble until the massive stars die either well most of them by uh, supernovae but um while they're shining and emitting a lot of light you see those bubbles and if you would accelerate this phenomenon within a galaxy you'd see uh, all these little like blub red blub in that rotating galaxy are star forming regions just appearing and disappearing and each of them live a couple of million years and a galaxy like that can replay probably that video just the ones every turn every galaxy turn is about 250 million years so um that's a lot of time <laughs> and so within one turn of the galaxy there's a lot of star forming regions just popping out you know and dispersing new elements and uh, and injecting energy by the the light of the massive stars and things like that so it's a very dynamic phenomenon um and it's important to study them um and how well do we see those regions is also important um you might be aware of orion that's one of the closest uh, star forming regions nearby it's about four 400 parsec away from us and it is a very small one, actually. It's four parsec across. Um, then you have like other galaxies that are close by. This is a dwarf galaxy, NGC 6A22. It has very massive star forming regions. This one has a hundred parsecs. It's like 25 bigger, 25 times bigger than Orion. And then you look at others, different size, like they, they have like really different kinds of content. And within other galaxies, you can see things that are even larger than that. Complexes that are like 250 times larger than Orion and, and so on. And, and so studying a lot of them helps understanding how this phenomenon happens everywhere in the universe in different situations. And um, I, uh, as a scientist, develop, develop methods to study that um, very efficiently. So this is an example with the galaxy NGC 628. Uh, um, and I have a code that uh, automatically identify region. So each little like black cross on, on those little regions are star forming regions or, or, or hot gas region. And then uh, the same code is also uh, doing the limits and kind of putting them in different zones so that we can study the emission coming from each of them separately um, and this is just a zoom in so you can kind of like see how it looks like and on that galaxy what is kind of crazy and mind-blowing is if you look at this tiny little region there that i circled in red it's just as big as this huge region that we just saw earlier that was like 25 times bigger than orion <laughs> and um if you'd put that re that region like back on on the same scale of the galaxy the same distance It'd be very, very small. And actually, Orion, you wouldn't even be able to detect it. Orion is that small. <laughs> so at the distance of NGC 628, uh, if Orion, there's something like Orion over there, you can't see it. So being able to see things from close by is important. Um, and that's why CITEL is uh, just such a beautiful instrument to do that. And uh, it, because it, it enables us to look at galaxies that are very close by. Um, and so you can look at galaxies that are huge in the sky and, and get a good chunk of the sky. They have like still has a really big field of view. So big images and covering galaxies that are very close. And so that's why we came up with Signals. So um, uh, I'm the pr principal investigator of Signals with a team of four other researchers, including Carmel Rabat actually, that, who was my, uh, my PhD uh, advisor. And SIGNALS is an acronym that stands for, and by now you should understand why <laughs> I decided to name it like this. It stands for Star Formation, Ionized Gas, and Nebular Abundances Legacy Survey. So SIGNALS wants to look at all of the star forming region around us, nearby the Milky Way. And um, we have about 70 researchers that have like the technical skills to study all of these regions uh, in different ways. Um, coming from all different countries. Um, right now we have 16 different countries that are participating. And we met before COVID and we're planning to meet again uh, next year. Um, and so by studying star-forming regions that are in 
different places of galaxy, some close to the center, some close to the outskirt, some in small galaxy and small and larger galaxy, you can see a uh, different situation. How stars are forming depending on where they are born. And if they're born in a different environment, what are their personality, their characteristic? Are they more massive, less massive? What is their chemical composition and things like that? Uh, and it's the first survey that is aiming at doing that uh, with such a large sample. Uh, so we are aiming at having 50,000 star forming region at the end of this. And we just completed the four years of observation um, last month. And we're going to complete it uh, with just a few more observations within the next year. But after that, we'll have our actually much more than 50,000 regions. It was an, an early estimate, but we got better than this. And we got them as, uh, in closed galaxies. So this way, we have a good resolution. We see in details the region. So this is minimum and maximum uh, details from signals that are highlighted in red here. Um, so we can really see uh, what's going on in the regions, and we can study them in detail. And that's important because um, a lot of studies either study things that are in the Milky Way, like Orion. Um, other studies like, can, can look at galaxies that are nearby, but then you start to do some assumption because you don't see an, a lot of details. And this, this is basically where we're at. We're, we're uh, at around this distance with signals, but we have a lot of spatial resolution because we have CITEL. And then uh, other, other survey or other studies are looking at galaxy much further away. And even further than this, where you basically don't see any details. And so if you want to study how stars are forming in those super far away galaxy, which means also far away means far away in time because the light took a lot of time to get to us. Well, you need some tools um, because you have a very, very small amount of information from those very far away galaxy. So Signal is going to help people that study the far away universe, but also back in time to, to analyze their data and give them a better insight on what they're looking at exactly. And uh, so the beauty of the data coming out of Citel is that it's not just an image, it's also a spectra. So each image are actually um, uh, have another dimension. So we call the data data cubes, uh, where one of uh, the, the dimension is the colors. Uh, and we have different filters. I know weirdly, like we have to split the colors in different bands. Uh, so this is just an example here for uh, our red band that is like fairly wide, contains multiple atoms uh, emission. And we have other ones also that are targeted with signals. And um, this is just an example of uh, half of our sample. <laughs> uh, some of the galaxy have to be covered in mosaics. So you might recognize M33 here <laughs> or parts of M33 here. And some other galaxies that are a little bit further away can be caught in one field of view. Um, and this, what you see right now is uh, the emission coming from the hydrogen atom. Uh, and some galaxy you can see like it looks like a wave because of the Doppler effect and the motion in the galaxy. But ultimately, that, that's what it looks like uh, for Sita. And you have multiple atoms, multiple emission line coming out of the data. So in that sample, I had for about 30,000 uh, H2 region or star forming regions uh, detected. And right now we have more than double this sample. So this is just one galaxy. And then you, you can identify the region with my code and then look closer into the regions and their emission uh, very quickly. Um, and you do that for thousands of them uh, all at once. Uh, you can also study their shape. So not only their emission, but um, like let's say one region like this, um, you can study its, its profile. So from the center out, what is the emission look like? So you can see here, here on that graph, how it is very peak in the center. And as you move away from the region, it gets slower. And then in the code, um, can I identify morphology of different kinds of regions? Some that, some that are spherical, some that are like asymmetric, more like ellipsoidals, and some that are more diffuse and filaments and things like that. So that's very convenient. And uh, we studied thousands of them at the same time with the code. Um, and it has a very, very good efficiency. I'm going to go quick on that because um, I want to show you uh, some, some super cool stuff 
And I know I'm already at half an hour. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's super cool. Um, so that's one a colored image uh, that was made out of the Citel data. Uh, this is four field on M33. Uh, and I choose the color according to the different colors coming from the atoms. So it's really the gas, the hot gas around massive stars. And uh, we're just going to do a closer look. Um, if you're careful, you might see some supernovae remnant, the ones that are kind of orange and green at the same time. This is a supernovae remnant, uh, like bubbles. If you have a good eye, you might notice some of them. But you see all these uh, other like kind of orange and orange with pink um, contours. Those are all star forming regions, but they don't contain necessarily the same stars. And that's why they might look so different. Um, even though they look different, they might have the same chemical composition because they're so close by in the galaxy. What is the difference in this case is that you have either uh, like a star that could be 10 times the mass of the sun center, or maybe the star that is even more massive, like 25, 50 times the mass of the sun. So it really changed uh, the kind of observation that you're making. Um, and since I have maybe a few extra minutes, um, I wanted to show you why is Citel so magical. Uh, so I have a couple of slides that will show you basically how the instrument is working. <laughs> what is inside Citel that makes it such a special instrument capable of doing images and spectroscopy? And the heart of the instrument Citel is what we call an interferometer. Um, so it is not just taking the light in and taking an image of the light. It is actually um, building interferences with the light. And I have a, a short video here that's going to show you how it works. So you have a source of light. You can imagine a galaxy at the bottom. It goes inside the instrument, and there's a piece of optic in the very center that is called a beam splitter. And the beam splitter, it splits the light in two equal components, one that goes up to the fixed mirror, one goes left to the moving mirror. They are reflected back onto the beam splitter in the center. And then they start interfering before getting detected on the photodetector. And that's what you measure. You measure either light uh, being um, aligned with each other, and then you see a lot of flux. Or uh, you move the mirror a little bit, and then the two beams are going to interfere, and you see something that is uh, lower, basically. Um, and it's what we call interferences. Uh, and you see on the, the bottom another video that shows a laser on, on a uh, coming out of one of those interferometer, and you see those waves of bright fringes and dark fringes, those are interferences coming from the light because light is a wave and it interferes. So that's a beautiful um, concept, <laughs> but how does it work? <laughs> so um, uh, you can imagine that you have a laser, one color interfering, doing those fringes. So basically you measure a light that is um, intense or very dark. Um, and it creates kind of like a, a sinusoidal kind of uh, looking, uh, uh, yeah, uh, interference. If you have a different laser, let's say a green laser, well, you'd see the fringes that are a little bit tighter, different. And um, this kind of information is actually exactly the same as measuring the light. Um, so there's a mathematical tool <laughs> that is very useful. Um, uh, that you can use to either uh, come come to, well, the interferometer allows you to measure those sinusoidal uh, shape, but then you use that mathematical tool that is called a Fourier transform, and then you get back those, those signals, those laser lines. And that's what Citel is doing. Uh, we're measuring interference, and then I get all of the data on my computer, and I Fourier transform them to get data cubes with the colors as a function uh, of the position in the cube. And uh, so all of my data are interferences. <laughs> and uh, you get used to see them. Uh, they look like sinusoidal uh, or beating patterns uh, in the light. So the light goes up and down constantly. Uh, and so depending on how many atoms, how many signals you have in your data, you will see different beatings and different waves in your interference pattern, and it's super cool. <laughs> and believe me, you get used to it, uh, although it might seem a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, kind of uh, abstract at the beginning. Um, and Citel is not the typical Michelson uh, interferometer like this one, because if it was, 
half of the light would go back into the galaxy. Um, and in astronomy, you can't afford losing half of the light. <laughs> so we tilted it uh, on the side and we have two mirrors, the beam splitter and two detector. So we get 100% of the light. And um, uh, so, yeah, you can imagine like uh, the, the same kind of pattern, the laser pattern uh, on the wall with the interferences. Instead of looking at the middle, you're actually looking a little bit on the side because it's tilted. So it looks like this. <laughs> and uh, if you are um, uh, taking data, uh, you have the two detectors. So one detector on top, the other detector at the bottom. Uh, and then the data look like something like this. If you have a laser inside the instrument, you really measure interferences. And um, with time, if you take a lot of different, um, if you measure a lot of interference with time, you have a very good interference pattern. And the Fourier transform on the right gets your, your spectra, your emission coming from the gas. And the more you have information on the left side, the more information you have on the right side. And then you can see I have five different colors in this spectrum that are just showing up after the Fourier transform. Um, and this is just for one pixel of an image. And you have four million pixel in a Citadel image. So four million spectra uh, to study. And so you get a galaxy like this, you can go across the different colors and see those, uh, those peaks, those, those signals coming up and down. Uh, and study them in the different star forming regions. Um, so that's how it works. And it was built in Canada and it's uh, something that we've developed here and that we have an expertise with. Uh, and that's why I was shipped to Hawaii to help people using it. Uh, and I, I'm continuing to do that. Um, so I hope you liked the presentation. Um, I was gonna leave you with this beautiful video of the motion of the star above the Mauna Kea uh, with the clouds below. And I hope it will inspire you some questions. Thank you. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I uh, I had heard Hawaii was good for surfing, but light wave surfing on interferometers, that is just too cool. Uh, what a great talk, Lori. Thank you so much for giving us all this captivating CFHT images and the images of its images and thousands of their images. So this has been a really wonderful talk and we do have a few questions uh, coming your way and a little bit of time we can take for them. So I'm going to pass to Emma uh, for questions now. Off you go, Emma. Great. Um, our first question tonight comes in from Betty. Uh, what causes gases to form clouds in the universe? Yeah. So um, there's multiple phenomena that happens here. So um, of course, gravity is important. So uh, you know, gravity is that force that pulls the matter together. So if uh, you start to have like a uh, an over density in some space, uh, an area of a galaxy, it will attract other particles and eventually get denser and denser. Um, but then you need a critical mass for a cloud like this to decide to collapse and form stars. Um, and before getting even to the point where it has that density, that critical density, it actually starts to form molecules and it's actually very cold. It has to cool down and start forming very large molecules. And it gets a temperature that are like 10 degree Kelvin, very, very cold. And um, they get denser that way because heat tend to, to disperse the gas. So when they get cold, they tend to, to, to get denser. And then eventually they get to a density that is just like very close to fourth star. And then sometimes something push it, like maybe a supernova exploded on the side or another cloud collided with it. And then it triggers that, um, that collapse. And you get that right density and then the, the star formation process is begin, has begun. <laughs> and then it's gonna create dark, even denser filaments and then, then in, in those filaments, you'll get stars. Um, but yeah, cooling and, and gravity is probably the, the main components here. Cool, thank you. Our next question comes in from the York U Observatory. The CFHT looks amazing. What's your favorite part about observing with that telescope? Uh, it's such a, you know, um, we, we, work, we work mostly remotely. We cannot be on the Mauna Kea for many reasons. It's a very high mountain. So you'd have like the symptoms from high altitude if you'd be up there during night. 
So we have remote observers that are controlling the telescope at night from Waimea, a town nearby that is not at the summit. <laughs> and um, I get to prepare the night. As an astronomer here, I uh, read the proposals from a lot of different uh, scientists from all around the world. And then we have a database of all the different programs with the different targets and how they should be observed, uh, with which instrument and which condition. And, and then I use all of that information to create the perfect night. And then uh, we have all the tools to, to send the comments to the telescope and to the, the, the technician that is controlling the telescope uh, to get the best data. So I like the fact that this telescope is, has been built for efficiency and to make use of every minute on the sky because it's really a privilege to be able to, to observe from, from, from the Mauna Kea. Uh, and we don't lose any minute. Uh, that's one of the beauty of it. That's great. Thanks. Um, this next question also comes in from York U Observatory. Han Solo made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Do you have any objects that size? Um, 12 parsecs size. So yes, I would. Um, some of the smaller uh, star forming regions are of the order of a parsec in size. Um, and uh, through the single sample of galaxies, we go up to 10 megaparsecs. So the resolution of which I'm seeing those small uh, star forming regions um, is probably past like, um, if I am at uh, the distance of something like uh, NGC 3344, like at uh, six megaparsec, I wouldn't necessarily see those or they, wouldn't, they would be blended with other things. Um, but anything closer to that, I can see them and I can resolve them in the closest galaxy like M33, the one with the, the beautiful colors, the, the image I showed you at the end, you'd see them with great details. Um, and the resolution in that galaxy is like less than one parsec. So uh, a region that is 12 parsec would have a couple of pixels in size. Cool, thank you. Um, this next one comes in from Rich Prentice. Very interesting. Are any of the telescopes open to the general public or are they just for astronomers? Aha, that's a good question. Um, yes and no. So <laughs> we do have programs uh, for high school students uh, that can actually uh, request observing, observing time. <laughs> and so they have to go through the same kind of process, you know, for, of writing a proposal, uh, submit their proposal uh, to a, a time allocation committee, and then uh, they are evaluated and some of the kids get the time. Um, and uh, but not necessarily for the, the general public, although the general public could literally write a proposal and send it to the director. And if it's well justified and the science is good, then the director has some discretionary time that they can allocate for programs and they don't have any special rules for those because it's the time of the director <laughs> and he can do whatever he wants with it. So technically, no, but at the same time, there's some ways to get some sometime if if it's uh if it's well justified <laughs> great um this next question is from chris vaughn do you select galaxies that most resemble the milky way in structure and composition ah no actually i selected galaxies that look the most different so our criteria for the signals galaxy was was like they need to be star forming because we are studying star formation um, but we want to cover all of the different environmental parameters. So chemical composition, mass, structures like bars, like uh, the, the, the rings or uh, the spiral arms, and also the comfiness and the, the stellar density, all of these different characteristics we wanted to cover kind of evenly. So that at the end with the 50,000 nature region or star forming region, we could literally pick, oh, okay, let's just check the ones that are in high stellar density, or let's just check the one that are at low uh, chemical abundances or high chemical abundances. And let's see if they are different uh, from each other and how. And we needed those really large number and the different kind of environment to do that. So we pick galaxies that are very, very different. Very nice. Um, this next question comes in from Suburban Astronomer. Are you going to be studying triggered star formation? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So uh, it, you, you need to have a tool to know when star formation has been triggered. 
uh, and by which phenomenon. So there's multiple ways to trigger star formation. In our sample, one of the way that we don't study is by uh, galaxies interactions. So we decided to pick galaxies that were mostly isolated to um, remove that uh, kind of part of, <laughs> to be not part of the equation because it is already a complex phenomenon. And we really wanted to study the most more the local environment effect. So we don't we didn't want a galaxy nearby to 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 kind of influence that. Uh, but uh, we are identifying their, the location of the region. So if they are in spiral arms or interarms in different structures, and therefore uh, depending on their location, they might be triggered by a density wave from the spiral arm. Uh, we can also see the supernova remnant or the signature of past supernovae. Um, so eventually, uh, I would say that's part of like the end goal of signals is to uh, see how many like regions were close or at like were influenced by a supernovae and if they have different characteristic. Um, but yes, this is kind of part of the plan. It's not easy, but you need to, yeah, to have some some way to to um, yeah to know if it was triggered or not. <laughs> right, of course. Um, Chris Vaughn would like to know, do you use machine learning to analyze the results? Are there ways to use volunteers to assist? Yes, uh, we do. I have a student, I have a, a student that is super um, interested in developing a lot of tools with machine learning. Um, so uh, right now, the kind of tools that we have developed uh, was for fitting the emission of those lines. So uh, you remember those spectra with the, the peaks? So they, the, we know where they should be, uh, but you need to measure their position to get the velocity and then their intensity and flux. And also um, we call that broadening, but sometimes the line get wider. Um, and that's because within the object, there might be a lot of uh, thermal activity and the atoms are just moving faster in all direction. And that tends to broaden the emission of the line. So um, to fit all of this, it takes a lot of time because it's four million spectra and sometimes five or six lines to fit at the same time. Uh, so he developed a method that uses machine learning uh, and a training uh, to do that very quickly. Uh, and we got super good results. Um, but we eventually want to develop uh, things that use machine learning for uh, the identification of the morphology of the region. And we are currently, and it's not published yet, but we are currently also identifying automatically if it's an H2 region, a star forming region, or a supernovae, or a planetary nebulae, depending on their emission, uh, automatically with machine learning. So very uh, powerful tool. <laughs> yeah, that's very cool. Um, this next question comes in from Ralph Shu. Are all of the galaxies you study spirals and irregulars? Yeah, so most of them are. Um, you know, elliptical tend to be very quiet on the star forming um, star formation side. So um, I don't have the numbers, but we do have a fair amount of irregulars because they're smaller <laughs> and they're of low metallicity. So we wanted to have a lot of those regions in our sample. Uh, so we took a lot of irregulars, and the other ones are mostly spirals. Um, yeah. Great. Um, this next question comes in from Betty. How does the age or distance of the galaxy factor into your interest in studying it? Yeah. Um, so uh, in, a, in a way, age and, and size and distance. So uh, yeah, they're like for the distance, it was, it was our resolution. So the, our ability to detect the regions that really put a limit to that. And we decided to, to stop at 10 megaparsec because at 10 megaparsec, you can resolve a region that is about 40 parsec, but nothing below that. So you start to lose details. So that was our limit for, for the distance. Uh, then for the mass of this, the galaxy, it kind of goes a little bit with the abundances. So if you have more stars, uh, larger galaxies, um, this galaxy will tend to have more metals, more heavier elements because the stars have contributed so much to it. So um, we wanted those uh, to cover this kind of like part of the abundance uh, space. So higher, uh, heavier elements and, and also the stellar density. Uh, but those galaxies are big. 
So one galaxy contains thousands of star forming regions. So you don't need as many to cover uh, thousands of those regions. So we have less of them, but nevertheless, they are uh, their weight uh, on our analysis is heavy because they have so many. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, that's it for the questions for tonight. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Laurie. I think we could probably stay here for quite a while chatting about the uh, CFHT and signals and what a wonderful program. I love the detail data you showed. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we do have to move on <laughs> um, and round off the show. So thank you. If ever someone wants to ask me a question, they can also uh, just email me. I'm very easy to find on the CFHT website. Uh, and otherwise, I'll, I'll let you do your meeting. And thanks again for inviting me. And bye, everybody. <laughs> Oh, well, absolutely. It's been our, uh, I'm sure, our pleasure. I'm speaking, speaking for everyone here. Um, but thank you once again for tonight. And I'd just like to take a minute to remind everybody that the um, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre does meet on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, these lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Matisse, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. So as we engage in astronomy here, uh, together we respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and the earth. And that is actually the end of the uh, official show, so I'm going to go ahead and hand over to our president of the Toronto Centre, Rask, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. Take it away, Tom. Thank you very much, Elena, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you had a wonderful view of our lunar eclipse uh, the other night. Unfortunately, I was completely clouded out here at the south part of Toronto. Uh, but let's get into our announcements. So, as Elena said earlier, this is one of two types of meetings we have here online on YouTube. Um, we've just had one of our speakers nights, and in fact, we have just had our last speakers nights for the season. Uh, we take a break for our speakers during the summer months, and our next speakers night will be in September. Uh, however, this does not mean that our meetings come to a complete halt, because our next recreational astronomy night is going to come up in June. is coming up in June on the 1st of June at 7.30 p.m. Chris Vaughn will be discussing the sky this month. Uh, Mehdi bozo Ray will be discussing high school astronomy in the digital age. And Dennis Ray will be talking about upgrade options for schmidt kastrin telescopes. Uh, here, as I said before, live on YouTube at Rast Toronto slash live. Uh, if you'd like to present something, we'll have other, uh, other recreational astronomy nights throughout the summer. Uh, so please contact Paul Markov if you'd like to present something. Moving on to what's going on at the DDO in the next coming weeks. Uh, on Friday, May 20th at 9 p.m. is DDO Up in the Sky. Uh, there's a $12.76 fee to uh, take part. You can register online. The links to this are, can be found at raskto.ca. Coming up in June is the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's General Assembly, from June 24th to June 27th. Uh, tickets are on sale now uh, to purchase tickets to get the full details of uh, the program. Please visit raskga2020.ca. So, as of April 1st, the Toronto Centre restarted our outdoor public outreach. Uh, just a reminder that we are recommending volunteers and visitors wear masks. Uh, and what we recommend the telescope operators disinfect their eyepieces, their focus knobs, and anything else that uh, people would tend to touch with a 70% rubbing alcohol following each visitor or family unit. And we require visitors to disinfect their hands before touching any information booth literature. And always as a reminder, uh, when you're making the decision to participate or not to participate, consider your personal health and comfort first. And there are no changes at the moment to any of our other operations. Our next outdoor star party is at Millennium Square on the 3rd of June. 
uh, 7 p.m. to midnight. Join us and our sponsor, Durham Skies, for an evening of free public stargazing along the North Shore of Wake, Ontario at Millennium Square. Observe the moon, stars through our telescopes, check out the literature at our booth, ask us questions, and bring your own telescope, and we'll be happy to help you set it up and aim it at the moon. Just a reminder that temperatures down by the lake can be cooler than expected, so please uh, dress accordingly. Uh, as I said before, wearing masks is recommended and disinfecting of hands. Please keep an eye on our website for a go no-go decision based on the weather uh, the day of the event before heading to the square. Now, our observing sessions at Baby Village Park, Long Sioux Conservation Area, and Ontario Science Center are still uh, not occurring. And the reason for that is because we are still looking for a chair of the observing committee to organize those events. Um, in the past, we've had a large team that divvied up the work. Um, who the working for someone to take charge, um, who would make those weather go or no go announcements, um, who would meet people uh, at the event, uh, meet and greet, and who would share a quick report the day after uh, online onto their forum and to uh, council. Uh, please contact myself at president at rasto.ca if you're interested. The CAO uh, is open, our club observatory in the Blue Mountains. Access um, to CAO facilities by members or families are members or families only in a non-communal fashion. The total site occupancy is limited to 10 bookings up to 25 individuals with one member or family upstairs in the house and the rest uh, members or families doing uh, day use bookings or so not staying overnight or independent campers or RVs or tents. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before you make your booking. Um, we're looking for some additional jobs to looking for some additional fill, volunteers to fill some jobs. We are still looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for a volunteer committee chair. We're looking for someone to head up our marketing committee and to fill that committee. We're looking for some assistance for our audio visual committee, the fine folks here who have been working so hard to put on these presentations. Education and Public Outreach Committee is looking for assistance, especially um, online presenters who can assist uh, in doing talks uh, to groups remotely, and as well, telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. For all of these, please contact myself at president at rasto.ca. Quick plug here for the benefits of RASC membership. Um, if you like what you've seen, um, and would like to contribute in a greater way, please get yourself a membership in the RASC. Comes with uh, various uh, features that are not available, such uh, which are included in the membership, such as our observer's handbook, our subscription to our magazine. Um, if COVID has thrown things for a loop and you're a longtime uh, uh, member, uh, the RASC Emergency Fund does exist. It's completely confidential. And as well, the National Office does sell gift memberships. Full details available by contacting mempub at rask.ca. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. Please follow us on all the forms of social media. Uh, if you like what you've seen here on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Click the notification bell. Um, for further updates, uh, stay safe, keep looking up, and have a good evening. Take care. Thank you.